let's talk about the notation that we have to write it in. So the notation for functions are quite specific. And the important thing is that if somebody asks you to find a function, you kind of have to assume that when you're trying to find a function, you are going to be trying to find this whole thing. So you're going to be writing out this whole expression here. You're going to write out this whole expression here if you're trying to find a function. If you're trying to find the rule of the function or the rule which represents it or they mention something like the equation or any kind of that type of wording then all you need to write is fx equals to blah and then you're done but if they ever mention that they want the function what you actually have to do is do it in function notation so include really in real terms you know like it's not that much extra information you have to actually find out. It's really just remembering the way it's supposed to be written. So it always starts with the function itself. So whatever the name of the function is. So F, G, H, they're really commonly used ones. You can really be any letter, just like, you know, you don't have to necessarily use X. You could really use any letter in the world. Um, so F is the most commonly used letter that you'll see for functions. G, H are also used not uncommonly. You might see P, especially when we talk about polynomials. P of X is also used quite a lot. But like I said, you can really use any letter. And then the next part, so that's the first part. So we need to make sure we write the letter. And when we kind of move on to composite functions later, or when we have inverse functions, it's important. So you just basically write everything before the brackets around the x or the brackets around your independent term so if it was f of g then you would write f of g like that so you know how you can also have this type of notation as well so you can write that or you can kind of write i would go with this type of notation to kind of write at the start here just because this is hard to break down into this um, but it's up to you and if we had an inverse where it's f inverse of x we would just do f inverse here dot dot so next what we put in is the domain so that's the input of the function and what happens there is like we were talking about before it's the values which are inputted into the function so that's where we pop our domain so it's a is our domain okay and then what we do after that is we get something called the codomain and the codomain in methods is always going to be r regardless of what function how weird how funky how beautiful it doesn't really matter it will always be r here so in fact we can kind of get rid of the b and just pop, pop an r there and what that actually means is so when we talk about the domain and the codomain is that the range or the output of the function will always be a subset of the codomain so this kind of like I feel like the idea of this was this was supposed to represent the domain and this was supposed to represent the range in in like you know kind of that's that's what the original idea was I believe but it probably didn't work out very well so they just popped an R there for all methods stuff so we we can just pop an R there and just disregard like if it's good it's useful to know that it's called the codomain and that it has vague connections to the range but i would say if you know to me always put an r there you're pretty safe as well okay cool and then the last juicy part which is always hardest to find is going to be the rule itself so the rule tells you tells you about the machinery so it's kind of like how does a so when we put flour into a mach into let's say if we put flour into a cake into a machine that makes cake versus if we make put flour into a machine that makes dough for bread or something how is that going to be different so the machines are going to combine them in different ways so if we kind of imagine the machine manipulating the the products or whatever's inputted it into different ways that's what's going to represent the rule part of the function okay amazing so that's kind of what we think of overall as the function notation itself. All right, so let's chat a little bit about a question here. Um, I'll give you, I'll, I'll pop this into the chat for you all to kind of consider and think about a little bit, because um, it's a good question to kind of get started on. So let's start by just 
trying to work it out together and kind of chatting about it a little bit. So what we're going to do first is we're going to just draw out the function. Um, let me just have a drink of water. So we're going to draw out the function first. And importantly, um, this is something I just recommend for essentially as soon as you see something which is non-linear and has an inequality of some sort, my first recommendation, first and foremost, is going to be you must, must, must draw it out. Because you can say that you can predict what's going to go on and all that kind of stuff, but I really do recommend you just draw it out because it's going to make your life a lot easier and you can just visually see it, especially if it's a multiple choice question because you can just draw it on your calculator and then you have something easy to refer to. Okay, cool. So you, we could pop this onto our calculator to, to draw it, but it might even just be faster for us to draw it. So let's draw a little bit of a parabola. Sorry, my parabola is a bit wonky on the side, but that's okay. All right, so we have zero, zero here. Alright, so then we kind of look at what the question is asking. So it's asking us about the range of f. And importantly, they've given us a domain to kind of consider. So we know that the dom of f is going to just be negative a to b. So that's our domain of f. It's going to be negative a to b. Alright, so we also know that b is bigger than a. I mean, b, yeah, b is bigger than 0 and a is bigger than b. So if we tried to dot in what a and b would be, no pun intended, Let's just say that's B and that's A. Cool. So then we also need to find out what negative A is, as negative A should be an exact reflection across the line X equals to zero, right? It should just be a reflection along that line or a reflection in the Y axis. So that's negative A there. So because this is a parabola and negative A squared would equal to A squared, i.e. just equals to A squared overall, we can see that these two would be the same point, right? All right, so we have those points. Now, the actual points we're gonna be working on is this point here and this point here, right? These two points is other points that we're gonna be considering here. This one is not really included in our domain. So what we're gonna do is we look at this one. This is an open circle, right? And this is a case of trying to look for the absolute maximums and absolute minimums, right? So we're looking at the lowest point and the highest points in the graph. So this is going to be the highest point because on this side it doesn't go higher than that. So it's going to be a squared is going to be our highest point. And because this was a round bracket, we're going to pop a round bracket here. Okay, so then we need to check for what's our lowest point. So we can check it's either going to be at special points like turning points or it's going to be at a endpoint, right? So we look at our endpoint, it ends up here versus our turning point, which ends up here. And we can see that actually the turning point is lower. So we're going to go with the turning point. So that's zero, right? And this is a squared bracket because it's included as part of the graph. Cool. So we can kind of see that it's option going to be option E here. So it is really useful to kind of graph it out. 